Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Hunt for the Ring. And I'm just gonna come right out and say it. In my experience, this is probably the best hidden movement game that's ever come out. This is a phenomenal experience. It is full of so many really smart, clever, just genre busting, you know, gameplay uh, flourishes that I'm just absolutely gobsmacked. Two full games for the price of one. The side A and the side B play so differently from each other, but both of them introduce really cool new things to what has kind of become the standard of hidden movement games. And now, when I say from my experience, I haven't played all the hidden movement games out there. I haven't played Letters for Whitechapel, for one, and I probably never will because, you know, the notion of trying to, uh, you know, hunt down Jack the Ripper is just going to be a huge turnoff for Jen. But we have played Spectre Ops, and um, Fury of Dracula and Stop Thief and uh, you know the original Scotland Yard and a few others besides. Uh, Not Alone is kind of a hidden movement game. And uh, yeah, this one I would put head and shoulders above them all for you know just the audacity of this design. I mean, although I mean there are definitely issues with it, make no mistake. Really, when it pulls right down to it, this is a three or four hour long game. I mean, it is because if you want the full experience, you have to play side one which is designed for the Frodo player to win. It is very, very difficult for the Nazgul to pull off a win in the first half of this game. It's interesting, the rules come with instructions for how to tip the balance in favor of you know one side or the other. Even if you tip the balance in favor of the Nazgul, you're still probably going to get a, a Frodo win in the first half. But that's because it's only one half of the game. Then you save your progress by packing everything away in the special letter from Gandalf here. Um, or you just keep playing. If you've got a full three and a half or four hours to play, you sit down and you do the whole thing in one sitting. Uh, that's unthinkable to me and Jen, which is why I think it's brilliant that they recognize not everybody has that much time to devote to a single game session so you can basically save your progress and pick up where you left off and then you know the game just radically changes but let's talk about these two halves of the game the the probably the coolest thing the two coolest things i really respect about side one one for the nazgul player which is in variable me I just have to say, Fantasy Flight developers, if you, I guess there's another fourth edition of Fury of Dracula coming, if it hasn't already come, they're probably not going to do this, but I would say to Fantasy Flight, please pay attention to this game. This is how you have a situation where one player controls four characters. You don't make that character have to deal with four, or that player deal with four characters worth of complexity, all of them with tons of special powers and items and this and that and, and Byzantine little rules you have to remember. You just say, no, I control four characters, but but they all share a common hand of cards that I can play on any of them at any time. And that instantly makes this much more approachable. This destroys, for again, for our taste, Fury of Dracula is a two-player game. Because even though in both games the um, the uh, the group player has to control four individual agents. The hunting player has to control four agents. Here, it is so much more pleasant. Um, you know, it's just you know, with less heavy lifting, less, right, okay, wait a minute, I've got, this character has three weapons, and this character has an item that will actually change this. Which one should I, you know, this is the way to go, and it works so nicely. I mean, uh, the, you know, the game, I would say, is streamlined enough to where it, you know, it feels like you could play this game only as a two-player game and get the full experience, not sacrificing any depth, but also not having to take on any onerous extra duties. So that, my hat's off to Ares Games for um, cracking that nut so well. But the thing I love even more is the Frodo gameplay of dots. This notion that um, you know Frodo's path is not necessarily written in stone. Um, you know he can, can give himself flexibility by effectively choosing for all intents and purposes, to stand still for turn after turn after turn. Now, standing still is often a reasonable thing to do in these kind of hidden movement games because, okay, oh, they don't know where I am. They're in the area. I'm just going to let them go. I'm just going to let them go past because they, they think they're going over there. I don't want to mix anything up. I'm just going to wait for them to move on or I'm going to stand still because they, they think that the one place that I might not be is where I actually am, that kind of thing. But you don't get anything other than just the clock ticking and wasting time. Here... Um, standing still is earning you a resource. It is f uh, dots because you never stop moving. You just start drawing more and more dots down. And you know, if you spend three turns effectively standing still, that means you have earned three dots that can let you make a big jump. And often, depending on where you're on the map, it can give you a lot of flexibility. Oh, I could be over here. I could be over here. I could be over here. That's a really 
really cool way to do it. Um, that, you know, while you are, quote, in the wilderness, you know, traveling from dot to dot, you are leaving yourself op open and, and, you know, taking a lot of options. That makes you a tougher thing to track. Although, somehow, those Nazgul will always, uh, you know, track you down, especially because of their cat-like perception. They can feel the ring. Of course they can. It's so thematic that they just have to reach out and, oh, no, he's in this area. He's still here. He hasn't left. He must be collecting dots. Let's pounce! You know, that's awesome. So cool. Um, and then, as cool as that is, the second half of this game, where suddenly, you're not Frodo, you're Gandalf. And you have no control over Frodo. Frodo, his die is cast. You know where he's going to go, you know when he's going to be there, and you have to split your time between running interference for him, but also um, completing your own objectives. But you are so fast! Shadowfax is an amazing horse! That's right, Shadowfax, isn't it? I'd have to ask Jen. She's the uh, Tolkien expert in our house. But, um, you know, you, you, it is so satisfying after the very, all the other characters move so slow. Although on roads, the, uh, you know, the, the Nazgul can move pretty fast. And at night, they can move pretty fast and all that, to be fair, to be fair. But, oh, traveling as Gandalf is such a joy. Because you need to be everywhere all at once to be effective, to split your duties between all the different things you can be focusing on. Um, you know, mind games through the roof in, in the second can have. Uh, you know, knowing when to, to to mess with the Nazgul and make them think they're one thing, but you can't push that too far because then they just won't trust. They won't even bother with perception anymore. They'll go for old-fashioned stuff so that you can't mess them up. I mean, really cool, cool stuff. And um, yeah, and you know, the while it's the the, the hiding character side that I think in both of these two games really gets the lion's share of cool, neat, innovative stuff. The Nazgul gameplay is great because it features my absolute favorite gameplay mechanism of all time. Dice drafting. You roll, cooperative dice drafting. You roll the dice. Um, you know, during this day, we're going to have to do 12 actions. We only have six dice. When do you use them where? No, no, no. You're in a better place. You, we, Okay, I, I would like to do perception, but I'll leave this for you so you can do it on your turn. That's okay. I'm in a shadow area. I can turn anything. I'll, I'll just turn this hunt because we're not really planning on hunting into you know another sorcery card so I can get... Oh my gosh, look at this. Wow, this changes everything. Um, you know, so there is a lot of fun to be had on that side too. And I think I've played this as a four-player game where one player had to control two Nazgul, uh, the other two controlled one, and then there was, uh, you know, the Hobbit running around. And I've played it more as a two-player game. I would say it works equally well. Certainly... Like so many cooperative games, I guess there is a danger of analysis paralysis. Or, no, I'm sorry, no, not analysis. Uh, no, it's the other common term. Oh, uh, quarterbacking alpha player syndrome. If there's somebody amongst the Nazgul players who, uh, you know, tends to, you know, take all the air out of the room and just like kind of, you know, bulldoze over everybody, that is something you have to bear in mind. I mean, but hey, that's why it's such a really great, satisfying two player game. Because again, like I mentioned earlier, they have done such a good job of, you know, dividing the load of one player having to control four characters while still, I mean, actually, I mean, it borrows from, I don't know if it does, I don't know if the de designers, but you know, from the wonderful, wonderful game Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia does this so well, and Hunt for the Ring does it equally well, better than any of the other hidden movement games out there, at least of the ones I played. Like I said, I've never played Lever for Whitechapel. A few of the smaller ones I haven't played either. But so both sides are very, very cool. And you've got this really cool, epic narrative arc because the game is designed so you will play it over two sessions with the save system. Um, you know, uh, the first half, how well, I mean, you know, it's the first half is a war of attrition. How much damage can the Nazgul do so they can finish uh, Frodo off in the second half when the tide turns in their favor and Gandalf really has his work cut out for him? I, it tells a great story. Everything is very rich and thematic. So many of these event cards and all that are tied to the books, um, you know, not tied to the movie, um, you know, which is why Mary doesn't show up right at the beginning like he does in the movies, for example. So, I mean, there's a lot to love here. That said, I will say the stuff we don't love and the stuff that unfortunately means I don't think it's necessarily a keeper for me and Jen. The biggest one, the, my biggest disappointment is the fact that well, I, I, it's a strength of the game. This incredibly long narrative arc that it will tell over the space of two sessions that are going to be 90 minutes apiece. That's really, really cool. But man, I wish, wish, wish the game would have come with rules to say, hey, you know what? Here is a completely satisfying and satisfactory standalone one session. The first session, you can never really do that because... 
it, you know, the cards are against the Nazgul. The Nazgul are very likely not going to win. Even if you do the little difficulty tweaking, that they say, hey, here's a little bit of something more you can do to help the Nazgul out, it won't be enough to win. Chances are, if you just play the first session, Frodo's going to win, because that's the way it's designed. And there's no rules, no way that you can set the game up to skip the first section and go directly to the second session. I wish there was. I think that's a real oversight because, you know, not everybody necessarily has, certainly not everybody has the wherewithal to be able to sit down for three to four hours to play both sides back to back. Um, you know, because I mean, yeah, that would just be too much. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be absolutely insane. But, um, you know, there's something lost, you know, because... If, you know, if we play the first one and then we come back a week later, yes, this is really great. We pull everything out. We uh, split up the, sh the cards that were left over. We, um, you know, it's, it's a new start, but you know, s that, that chain, that narrative link, it's there, but it's just not as strong as it, I imagine it would be if you play it all the way through. And you know, sometimes I, you know, I, I want to be Frodo and have to deal with this really cool um, dot puzzle. Sometimes I want to be a Gandalf, where you have to play this really crazy set of never-ending mind games um, because you can be as offensive as defensive, much more so than most of these hidden movement games. But you can't. It's designed to only be played one way. And like I said, that's a strength, but it's also kind of a weakness, and that really kind of bugs me. Um, although, man... Not that it has anything to do with anything, but another incredible feather in this game's cap. If you want epic, long-term, multi-session stories that evolve over games, play Hunt for the Ring one night and finish the first half. And Frodo, he'll be hurt, he'll be down on his ropes, but then Gandalf will come in and save him and get him the rest of the way. That's cool. Um, then, on the next night, play the second half. And um, you know, whether Frodo wins or loses on the third night, get out your copy of War of the Ring, because Hunt for the Ring is from the same design team and the same publisher as War of the Ring. War of the Ring is a very mega popular quasi, you know, hidden movement war game um, that tells the story of Lord of the Rings after Frodo leaves Rivendell all the way up to Mount Doom. While, you know, the forces of light and shadow are gauging in war stuff, you know, Frodo and his folks are just trying to sneak through the world as best they can. But the beautiful thing is the rule book for this, the whole last uh, couple of pages are devoted to whether Frodo made it or not to Rivendell. If he didn't make it to Rivendell, if, if the Shadow Player won, or the Shadow Players won, you just assume that Elrond and his elves were somehow able to rescue Frodo and get him to Rivendell after all. And then you start playing um, uh, War of the Rings. And you even use these tokens. These tokens that the game comes with are not used in Hunt for the Ring. These are for War of the Ring. So that the, the impact of having made it to Rivendell echoes on as you play a full-on big epic game of War of the Ring. And that is mind-blowingly awesome. The meta connection between these two games is so cool. So, I mean, fans of War of the Ring, and I know there are a lot of them out there, I mean, this, you know, becomes a very big, heavy, and weighty aperitif for your uh, nightly joy. I mean, I love that. I love that string-together narrative that's so cool. It's just unfortunate that, I mean, well... Because of the nature of, of, of my game playing experience, doing Rotto Runs Through, which means I rarely get to go back and play games over and over again. Um, you know, so this doesn't really fit for me um, and Jen. So if we were ever to be able to get it out, we would need to have just a little self-contained, fully designed game, and this doesn't give it. If you want a fully well-designed, well-balanced uh, battle of wits, you have to develop, you know, devote three to four hours over one or two sessions, and that's just something that's not really going to be compatible with me and Jen. And I just so wish they the developers would have done a little bit of extra work. So you can, hey, here's how you um here's how you rebalance. You know, the uh, you know Frodo has a shorter corruption target to hit and the Nazgul start much closer. You know, uh, some simple things to really balance and make a uh, side uh, side one, you know, the first half of this game fully evenly um, balanced on both sides or Rules so that we can just skip the first one and go straight to being Gandalf running around trying to run interference for crazy Frodo who is just going to follow this pre-programmed path. But hey, every once in a while, he jumps paths and oh man, so many cool ideas. I am so impressed. That's why I said right up front, I mean, no other hidden movement game can even come close um, to Hunt for the Ring in... in uh, in comparison to how many interesting, really game-changing ideas it brings to the table. And the beautiful thing is, they all work 
so well. You just have to be the right type of player with the right time of you know a gaming schedule to make it all come together. And if you do, Hunt for the Ring is something really, really special. And that's it, folks. That is the run-through. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye.